Here in Mark chapter 8, Jesus Christ challenging us in our discipleship, beginning in verse 31. The Bible says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So what do we savor? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful for this opportunity to assemble in the name of Jesus Christ to open your precious word and allow the Holy Spirit to now speak to our hearts personally. We pray that we'll open our hearts and listen and learn and respond, and that we would be changed through its power today. May you be glorified through this service, and please, with, please with our response, Lord, and may we honor you by honoring your word, by listening, and Lord, may we honor you by obeying. So we commit the service to you, and thank you again for it. We love you, in Christ's name we pray. This is not the first time that Jesus pulled his disciples together and began to share exactly what was going to happen to him. And in every case, they didn't understand. They did not understand what was coming. Uh, there's another passage over in Luke 18, very similar. The Bible says they understood none of these things. Jesus laid it out. I'm, I'm going to be tried, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise again. And they didn't understand. They, they didn't comprehend. They thought Jesus had come to, yes, be their Messiah, but to set up his kingdom. And that, that's what they were excited about. But they did not understand the coming Calvary. And yet, you and I are so grateful for Calvary. Amen? That was part of God's plan. That he be rejected and that he die as our substitute. On, on the cross and then rise again for our justification and our eternal life. But isn't it fascinating? You know, Peter, we often give him a hard time for sinking, but he's the only one that walked on water. And he did often speak before he thought. Some of us fall into that category. And this was one of those times. And I know that it's hard for us to even imagine someone actually rebuking our Creator, but he did. It says there in verse 32, he began to rebuke him. And so Jesus here said, this is what's going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to they're try me. They're going to kill me, and I'm going to rise again. And Peter, his response was to rebuke Jesus Christ. And say, how dare him? How blasphemous. And yet when a trial comes in our lives, or when, when circumstances send things in our lives that we don't expect, and our response is to get angry, at God, we're doing the same thing. What we're saying is, Lord, you're making a mistake, or Lord, this wasn't supposed to happen in my life. And it's the same as what Peter did. Now, he might have been vocal about it, and we obviously wouldn't vocally say to God, Lord, I'm angry with you. Well, maybe we do, but I hope not. When a trial comes, we've got to understand God designed it, God allowed it. And life is never going to give us what we expect or even what we want, necessarily. But it's going to give us what God says is best for us. And those two things aren't always compatible, are they? So let's look at a couple of scriptures in 1 Peter, if we could, and just be reminded that when the trials do come, when life does send things our way, 1 Peter chapter 1, first of all, we need to learn to respond properly and not like Peter and get angry because Peter, he wasn't rebuking Jesus because 
He, he was angry at Christ necessarily. He was rebuking Jesus because this isn't what he thought was supposed to happen. He didn't want to lose Jesus. He was his disciple. He'd been with him for years. He obviously loved the Savior. And Jesus says, I'm going to die. He doesn't want Jesus to die. Somebody says, I'm going to die. We, we don't want that. And so but before we get too angry at Peter, let's be careful because when God sends a trial our way or when things don't go the way we want them to go and we say, well, this isn't fair, aren't we doing the same thing? So 1 Peter 1, 7, the Bible says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than the gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory, the appearing of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. Rejoice. Rejoice at trials. That's what God says. Now look over in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verse 12. Beloved, he says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. And yet isn't that our response every time when the fiery trial comes? It's like, whoa, this is a mystery. This is strange. This is weird. This shouldn't have happened. God even says in his word, Think it not strange when the fiery trial comes. Don't be shocked. Don't respond that way, he says. Uh, he goes on to say, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice, verse 13, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. So the trial is going to be the same, but our response is up to us. We can respond, like it says in verse 12, and say, whoa, this is strange. This shouldn't have happened. Or we, like in verse 13, can rejoice. And say, now I get to just get a little glimpse of what Jesus went through for me. All the pain, all the abuse, all the lies that were told. Now I get to get just a little taste of what Jesus paid for me. And when we get to heaven, are we going to look back and say, oh, I wish I hadn't had that trial? Of course not. We're going to be thankful. We're going to have no regrets about the trials. We will have regrets about our responses, of course. But no regrets about the trials. Do you think Peter regretted rebuking Jesus Christ himself? Of course he did. Because it gets worse, doesn't it? Verse 33 of our passage, let's go back to Mark 8. When he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter. So in verse 32, Peter rebukes Jesus. And in verse 33, Jesus rebukes Peter. Of course, if Jesus rebukes us, we need it. Amen? Because he always does the right thing. He tells us in Revelation 3, 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And there are many times in our Christian lives when God has to rebuke us. God has to chase us. Because we aren't listening. Because we're not obeying. Because we're not responding as we should to the trials that he allows. But look what he says. Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, that's a pretty heavy rebuke, wouldn't you say? For Jesus to look at, at Peter, who's going to become one of those, the most prominent disciples in the early church, and to say, get thee behind me, Satan. What's he saying? That right now, Peter, you are being controlled by the devil. By rebuking me for telling you that I'm going to go and die at the cross, you are being led by the devil. That's pretty heavy. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And that was the problem, wasn't it? What, what Peter was savoring was, this is what I want. I want to keep Jesus. I don't want Jesus to die. I don't want to lose him. That's what I say, but that's what I want. I, I, I. Jesus said, you're, you're not savoring the things that God wants. You're savoring the things that you want. And how often do we fall into that same trap? We're here to please him. Amen. 
Amen? We belong to him. And we're here to savor the things that he wants. Savor means to desire. And we have a choice to make. We talked about this in Sunday school. God's given us a free will. And so let's look at a couple scriptures. Look at Philippians 3.19. And let's realize that we are here to not only serve the Lord, but we're here to savor the things of the Lord. <laughs> the things that he wants in our lives. Which does, those two things don't often line up, do they? This is what I want, and this is what God wants. And it's a blessing when they do line up, by the way. But notice uh, Philippians 3.19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So there are Christians whose God is their belly. That's, that's, as, you know, that's as literal as you can get when it comes to what we savor, isn't it? And there's some Christians, that's, that's what they savor. Is, it is food. It's God is their belly. And then he goes on, if you Colossians, the next chapter, the book over, chapter 3, he says, uh, verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So God's commanding us to not set our affection on things of the earth, but to set our affection on things in heaven and in in things of God, things that are going to count, things that are going to last. That's what we're to savor. And, of course, we know 1 John 2.15, love not the world. We looked at that in Sunday school. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So God says, I want you to be savoring my things. I want you to be savoring my will, my plan." Stop savoring the things of man. And he says to Peter, Peter, you're being led by the devil right now because you are not savoring what I want and what God wants. You're savoring what you want. It's called selfishness. It's one of our biggest problems as humans, isn't it? It's being self-focused, self-centered, just selfish. I want what I want because I want what I want because I'm selfish. And how often does that get us in trouble? So now Jesus is going to give us the contrast to selfishness in verse 34 of Mark 8. He says, so he now, he says, now we have another learning opportunity. Jesus did this so often, didn't he? So something like this would pop up, and then Jesus said, oh, here we go. Time to sit down. Let's have a class. And so he calls all the people, it said. He called the people unto him with his disciples. He said, everybody, Peter just taught us a lesson. Let's learn from this. And he said, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Peter isn't doing that right now. Peter's not denying himself. He's not denying what he wants. And he just rebuked the God of heaven for telling the truth. How many times do we do the same? <clears throat> Paul says, I'm crucified, right, with Christ. We're to deny ourselves. We must be willing to be that living sacrifice, as we read in Romans 12, 1, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what Jesus says. He says, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to come after me, if you want to savor the things of God, you need to deny yourself. Stop being so selfish. Stop, stop being self-centered and self-focused. And start focusing on the things of, of, of God. And take up your cross and follow me. For whosoever, verse 35, will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. We are never, ever going to regret giving our lives for him. Literally living for him and even if necessary dying for him but we will not regret it when we get to, to heaven lose your life he says and you'll save it when you go to John 12 24 Jesus explained it as a as a piece of of wheat something that we can all understand is to take a seed and 
The seed's quite amazing when you think about it. It can just sit around in a box or whatever. How's that possible? But then you add some dirt and some water and some sunlight, and it blossoms into a tree or a plant or something. But how's that even possible? Think about it. Just this seed just laying there, dry and nothing to it. You just pop it in the dirt, give it a bit of water and sun. Boom. So in John 12, 24, look what he says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it standeth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So he's saying that a seed essentially doesn't die until you pop it into the ground and then it becomes something else. And Jesus is saying, this is what I want from you. I want you to die so that you can bring forth much fruit. Because now you're going to live through me. That's what Paul meant when he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He said, now God's living his life through me. I'm dying to self. Now go to Philippians 3 and verse 7. Paul here again expressing his own personal struggle with selfishness, which we all have. And look what he, he's concluded about it here in Philippians 3, verse 7. He says, But what things were gained to, man, to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. My Lord. Isn't this the same thing Jesus said? He said, I've counted it all but lost. What's he say? Deny himself. Take up his cross. None of it matters. Thank you, Peter, for teaching us a lesson. Don't get angry at God. Don't really try to rebuke God for the trials, for the circumstances. Instead, embrace them as from God and a learning opportunity for, for us to learn that we aren't here to be selfish. We aren't here to savor the things that be of man, but we're here to savor the things that be of God. Verse 36, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now, the world doesn't look at it this way, of course. But he's saying that, think about what he's saying, that one soul is worth more than the whole world. You know, we have billionaires today. It used to just be millionaires. Now we have billionaires. You know how much of those billions they get to take with them beyond the grave? short time on earth is very short compared to eternity, isn't it? Those millions aren't going to mean a thing when they stand before God. God doesn't care about money. It's all he's in here. And he's the one that gives us the power to get wealth, the Bible says. So what shall it profit a man, and from an unsaved point of view, what's he saying? That many people are choosing to Please the soul to please self and to go to hell. How sad is that? And if you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll see this, but God is saying that there are many who are just out to gain and gain and gain, to gain money, to gain pleasure, to gain whatever they can gain at the cost of their own soul. That's that's scary. And yet that's most people, isn't it? 2 Thessalonians 2, look at verse 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. Look at the rest of the verse. To have pleasure in unrighteousness. Rejecting Jesus Christ is a choice. People try to wrap it up in a bunch of different excuses. But in the end, if you're not accepting Christ, you are rejecting Christ. There is no middle ground with Jesus. And he said, He that's not with me is against me. And the unsaved are making a choice to choose other things over the value of their own soul. Wow. So and what about Christians? How many times do Christians make a decision to say, This is more important? Then what's best for myself? <clears throat> and if you
go to Luke 12, Jesus talks about how, how we as souls often, Luke 12, 19, make those kind of decisions. And Christians do it all the time. They say, well, you know, this, this is more important than my soul being developed for Jesus. I'd rather pursue power. I'd rather pursue money. I'd rather pursue things. I'd rather pursue the pleasures of this life rather than feed my soul. Or do what's best for my soul. Roman, uh, look at Luke 12, verse 19. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? This is the modern day equivalent of a billionaire. Who has so much he doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> So he says, I'm going to build bigger barns and bigger barns to store it all in. And God says, what are you going to do after you die? You get to take none of it with you. Timothy, or Paul said to Timothy, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can take nothing out. We came in as a little baby, naked with nothing, and we're going to leave Physically with nothing. Now we get to gain heaven. Hallelujah. We're saved. But we take nothing with us. From this earth. Matter of fact. As, if you look around on this earth. The Bible says it's all going to burn up. God's, God's not going to flood the earth. Like he did the first time. He's going to burn it up. It's in 2 Peter. And so as you look around. The only thing that you can actually look at. With your physical eyes. That will last beyond those fires is people. And this. The word of God will live forever. That's it. Everything else you can touch or feel or taste will burn. That's what God is saying. What shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world, gain everything, and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. Look at uh, Hebrews 11, if you would. We'll see the example of Moses who had a choice. Moses could have kept his mouth shut about his Jewish heritage and just enjoyed being Pharaoh's adopted son. One of the wealthiest men literally in the world. Think about it. He gave it all up. All of it. One of the wealthiest men in the world and he went to be just a shepherd out in the desert. Hebrews 11, 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of He decided that living for the Lord was better and more important than all the riches in Egypt, or all the treasures in Egypt. He made a decision that day when he decided to defend his Jewish brother and reveal his Jewish heritage. Up to that point, he hadn't. And once he did, of course, he had to flee. And that was it. All, was, all that wealth was gone. And then, then he had to pastor three million rebels. <laughs> Imagine that. A bunch of people that got angry with him all the time, and always blamed everything on him, always wanted to rebel against God. He took that in place of being one of the wealthiest men in the world. Because he understood. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus is asking us that question. What's worth more? What's worth more than doing what God wants for us? What's worth more than savoring the things of God versus savoring the things of man? What's worth more than making sure that we're doing what God wants us to do for our soul? Feed our soul with his word. Obey the Lord. Obey his commandments. Serve him with our gifts and our time. 
Because we're going to get to heaven and not regret any of that. But we will regret when we've decided to say, well, this is more important. And he says to Peter, Peter, what you're saying is that it's more important that I stay with you than it is that I go to the cross. Well, I'm glad Jesus went to the cross. I'm, I'm sure you are too. But Peter was looking at it from a selfish point of view. I don't want to lose Jesus. I want him right here with me. So think about that perspective. Do we savor the things of God or do we savor the things of man? What are we willing to say is worth more than our soul when there's nothing in it, of course? And what shall a profit man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So what do we savor? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for how you...